Hello and welcome to this BAFTA live stream from Creative Assembly. My name's Anna and I'm a senior cinematic artist. And my name's Ray, I'm a lead cinematic technical artist. Myself and Anna both work in creating trailers to help market the Total War series. And we're going to spend the next hour discussing the steps we take when creating one of our trailers using the reveal trailer for Troy as our case study. We've joined up with BAFTA Games for this live stream as part of our BAFTA Crew Games program, a network for people currently working in the games industry to have access to BAFTA award-winning talent and nominees. Creative Assembly has been nominated for over 15 BAFTA awards during our 33 years of developing games, and we often support BAFTA in their work to inspire more young people into game dev careers. Right, with that, let's begin. So in today's presentation, we're going to cover our stages of production, our cinematic animation pipeline, and our workflows. So the team who creates these marketing assets are called the cinematics department. And the cinematics team can be split into four types of artists. We have our cinematic artists, and they're responsible for developing the concept of the trailer, camera creation, set dressing, lighting, VFX, and editing. We have our animators, who are responsible, unsurprisingly, for all the animation on our trailers. We have our generalists, who are responsible for supporting all the art requirements of the trailer. And we have our technical artists who are responsible for all our tech support and for developing our rigs and our shaders and our tools. So hopefully you've all had a chance to give our trailer a watch, but just in case, um, I'll give a quick summary. So our trailer shows how the Trojan War began. On one side, we have the brothers Agamemnon and Menelaus who are preparing for war to retrieve Menelaus's wife, Helen who has run away with the dashing Paris. And on the other side, we have Helen and Paris, who have fled to Troy where Paris's brother Hector must also prepare for war as a consequence of his brother's foolish actions. So our trailer begins with Paris meeting Helen and ends just before the siege of Troy. So when creating a trailer, we have three stages that we need to work through. Um, and these can be defined as pre-production, production and post-production. So you can see from this diagram that each stage has a number of different subtasks that we have to complete before we're allowed to move on to the next one. So our first stage is pre-production. And this usually begins with a kickoff meeting with the whole of the team who's gonna be involved in the trailer. So in this meeting, you're gonna be presented with a brief and this is gonna outline all the key information that you need to know such as how long you have to work on the project, what the trailer has to include, and also what it must avoid. When generating ideas for our trailers, we have to be really careful not to assume that our audience is gonna know the time period of characters extensively, if at all. For Troy, we felt quite confident that a lot of people would be familiar with the wooden horse aspect, or maybe even had seen the movie, um, but perhaps didn't know the characters or the stories in detail. So when looking for our initial inspiration, what we tend to do is to research into the backstories of our characters and look at the content that's already available to us in the game. Now this could be anything from a beautiful map or, or a piece of animation, anything that just stands out to you and get, gets like your ideas flowing. After the initial kickoff meeting, the lead cinematic artist uh, needs to develop these ideas into a form that the whole team can start to visualize how the trailer is going to play out. So the first step to achieving this is to create a script. Now the script's going to go through many, many versions as the ideas start to develop and evolve. And there's going to be a lot of back and forth with um, our lead cinematic artist and the rest of the team. Then eventually when they're happy, they can show it to the heads of marketing. And if they're happy too, we can move on to storyboarding. So our lead cinematic artist is gonna work with a storyboard artist to flesh out all those camera angles, which they, can, which they then cut together um, to show a timed version of the trailer. They can also add in any temporary music and dialogue. 
Like with the uh, script, there's going to be multiple meetings between the lead cinematic artist and the rest of the team as these storyboards develop. And again, when the heads of marketing are happy, we're ready to move on to our next stage, which is production. So most of our hero animation is aided by motion capture. But before we record anything at all, what we like to do is to film a rehearsal run. Now we found that this benefits us in a number of ways. First, it allows the motion capture shoot to just go a lot quicker and smoother, as everyone knows exactly what's expected of them. They know where to stand, what beats to hit, any questions they may have, they would already have checked them with the lead animator or our lead cinematic artist. It's just a lot more organized this way and everybody feels just more confident and a lot happier. Second, it just helps us to refine our shot lengths as we're gonna cut this live action footage into our edit. So when we make our storyboards, we try as accurately as possible to try and time out the movements, but it's only really once you see um, these acted out in live action that you really begin to get a much better understanding of how long each shot's going to take. And finally, when we do record our motion capture, we only record our actors' bodies, not their faces. So the footage that we're recording here at rehearsal is going to be such great reference for our animators later down the pipeline when they're looking for facial reference. Over to you, Ray. Thanks, Anna. Now we're going to talk a bit about the animation and assets pipeline. So we render everything in engine and we use the game assets as well in our trailers. But as you can imagine, um, even though it looks really good in game, there are times it doesn't really hold up for cinematics since it's, we're getting really close up and we have different requirements on what the game has. So before we start a trailer, we usually answer a few questions such as what are the key assets that are needed, um, how close do they get to the camera, and what sort of motion will be expected out of them. So when we answer these questions, we'll be able to figure out which characters need some extra tweaking just to get it to work uh, closer to the camera as well. And if the rigs need upgrading or um, if there's anything else that we need to update. Now for the models, we do need to do two steps, which is increasing the resolution of the models since we have a lot more deformations and we need to do a, a lot more to the model and their higher requirements. And we also tweak the loop flow so to match what we need for animation. So for example, in this image here, you can kind of see how we have um, a game mesh, which works great for what you see in game. Though for us, since it's a lot closer up, we need to tweak a lot more things such as increasing the resolution. And then we try to tweak the flow so it better matches what we need from the face deformations and so on. And it's kind of similar for the clothing and other parts of the character as well, such as the hands, etc. So we do a pass on increasing the resolution, especially wherever we need a little more deformation. And wherever we need to hold the volumes better, we'll add extra loops and so on. And of course, any texture fixes. Now for the models, for, especially for the face, what we usually do is we reproject from the base mesh, and this saves us a lot of time. We don't have to rebuild the mesh all the time, and you're basically reusing work that you've done before, so it just makes a lot more sense. It's a lot more efficient. So here you can see an example of a base mesh that was created once for one character, and we've reprojected it onto another character so that we can project the textures back onto it, and reuse the uh, waiting information if we need to, or reuse any other information that we built for the old character, or the old base mesh, rather. On the texture side, we do cleanups as well, if required. Um, depending on what's needed for the camera, there are times we need to rebake some textures or uh, clean up some of the bakes that we see, or you know, add extra detail if required. Now, part of the asset pipeline is also building the cinematic rigs. And um, here we usually split that up into the face, the cloth, the 
correctives if required and the accessories and accessories could contain the weapons and so on. So for example, in the general rigs, we, if required, we'd add a, a little more uh, defamation for the hair, uh, cloth, weaponry, if required. And if it's correctives, depending on what's needed for the cinematic, we'll go in and add a few extra corrective joints and we'll clean up the uh, silhouettes of the shapes as best we can. And now for the face rigs, we have an underlying facts based setup, which is facial facial action coding system. And all of these are driven back into joints that we use in engine. So as you can see here, there's a very quick example of the rig working on this face. Here we have a few more examples of how the rig works. So the rigs are split into multiple layers, depending on what the animator needs to tweak and so on. Here we have a quick example of an animation of the cinematic rig. Again, this is all in engine. And that's pretty much the assets pipeline very briefly explained. And now I'll go ahead and talk a bit about the animation pipeline that we have. So when we start the trailer, we'll have a screenplay so that we can decide what's, what's needed for the shots, um, what kind of character motion is needed and so on, similar to what we were doing earlier. And we can time box that so we can decide what needs to be filmed. So we do have a motion capture pipeline where once we decide what's needed, and in the previous slides that Anna showed, you could kind of see the uh, the live action test we did. So once we make a decision on the shots that we need, we can go to the motion capture studio and start recording the takes that we want for these shots. And once we do that, we take that into um, our animation packages. So for example, we use Motion Builder to process most of our motion capture. Uh, we'll start chopping it up into the sections that we need. And then this gets passed down into our Maya animation pipeline that we start to iterate on where we'll bring in the cameras, we'll start laying out the scenes, and then it's again iteration on iteration. So here's a quick example of a motion capture session. And as you can see here, this matches very closely to the live action that we did. Now, once we've filmed our motion capture session, we bring that into Motion Builder. And in Motion Builder, you'll basically have the three skeletons that we use for capture, and this is the whole session basically captured. So another thing we need to do is we need to start processing this data and start to break it down into little bits and cleaning up the data as well. So what we'll do is we'll start to clean up the data, retarget it back to um, some of our motion builder skeletons that we use, which are driven by HIK. And then we start breaking everything down into clips. And once that's done, we start exporting these skeletons and the animations out into Maya. And once it gets into Maya, we have another part of the process where we retarget these uh, HIK skeletons. And these will get retargeted back to the rigs that will finally be used by the animators. Now, once the animation has been retargeted, the animators do need to go in and start cleaning it up because the motion capture gives you a base. It doesn't give you a final animation. And that comes from the skills of the animators. So they'll start to go in and they'll start bringing the animation to life from the motion capture data that's there. And once that's done, everything gets exported into a proprietary format that the engine uses and we bring it in and stop putting the shots together. Here's a little fun, uh, fun little animation of just retargeting to the characters. 
this never made it in the trailer. It should have. And with that, I'll uh, pass this back to Anna. Thanks, Ray. So whilst the motion capture data is getting processed and exported by the animators, our lead cinematic artist is going to take this time to re-record all the dialogue, but this time with professional actors. So as you can see, we provide our actors with a script. And at this stage in production, we're usually pretty confident with the lines that we want to use. But sometimes, as you can see here, we do provide them with some alternative lines. So the reason for this is because an actor's schedule is super busy and we just can't guarantee that we'd be able to bring them back further down the pipeline should we need to re-record any lines. So if there's even a tiny bit of hesitation, if anyone at all is umming and ahhing or just generally unsure, what we like to do is to try and provide some alternative lines just in case we need to use them. Then, after the recording session, we just cut our best takes into the edit. So the remaining stages of production are broken down into three whips. For cinematic artists, whip one is all about blocking out our cameras. And we do that using our in-house software, which is called Composite Scene Editor, or Comp Scene for short. So as soon as the animators have begun processing that motion capture data, we are able to access it here. We work on a shot by shot basis, so as soon as we have just even one shot that has characters with animation on, we can just jump right in there. We don't need to wait for our animators to process everything before we can start working. Although in WIP1 we're only blocking out our cameras, we're going to continue to use Comp Scene as we work our way down the pipeline to complete most of the trailer. It's a really powerful piece of software and it allows us to do all sorts of things such as bringing in rigs, props, animation, uh, create and animate cameras, add VFX, light. It also has lots of features that have been inspired by Maya such as its navigational controls and its graph editor. One thing it can't do yet but should do by some point this year is to show us our shots directly in Engine. For this we need to open the work we've already created in Comp Scene into our second piece of in-house software uh, called Cindy and place the shot where we like within the game. We can then look through our camera and see exactly how the shot's going to appear once rendered because our batch render tool reads all of our scenes directly from Cindy. So WIP2 sees a really big push in the development of our trailer. At this stage of production, all the animators are going to be working on cleaning up all of the hero animations um, and adding a facial pass. Whilst the cinematic artists are going to develop the cameras further and have a first pass on set dressing, uh, background animations and a weather pass. So in Comp Scene, we work using a referencing system that allows us to have multiple artists working on different aspects of the trailer at the same time without affecting anyone else's work. So we really can be all hands on deck at this stage and just really push forward. So you may have noticed that most of our trailers use the line, the trailer footage shown uses the in-game engine. So this is because our trailers have to strike a balance between art and function. So the art is the storytelling and emotion, whilst the function is explaining to the audience what our game is and why they should be excited to play it. So although our trailers provide a narrative, they have to also give a sense of what a player actually does in Total War and just be super careful not to misrepresent any of the gameplay features. Which is why everything else you see, the rigs, the background animation, the props, they can all be found within the game and they're all part of the Total War package. So following on from that, when we choose our background animations, we select them from an animation library, and that's going to show us all the animations that are featured within the game. And it's the same idea when we adjust our weather and our time of day in Cindy. And we do this using a tool called the Environment Editor. So what we do is we load up pre-existing environments that are already found in the game, and then using this slider system, we just adjust them to make our trailers look as cinematic as possible. WIP3 sees a further pass over everything we've done so far, with the addition of a bespoke lighting and a VFX pass. 
Again, because we need to showcase exactly what's available in the game, we only use VFX that feature in the game. So as with the animation library, we have a VFX library. So we do our bespoke lighting pass in comp scene, and we do this to add just that extra level of cinematic detail. To do this, we load in the weather we already created in Cindy, and then we can add in our own lights just to complement them. Now this could be to add sparkle to a character's eyes, or maybe to add um, to darken some shadows, to add some definition, anything that's just going to subtly make our trailers look just that little bit more cinematic. Once WIP3 has been approved, we hit time lock. Now this means that the length of our trailer cannot change. And although cameras can still be tweaked, the shot lengths have to stay the same. The reason for this is so that we're able to write up a music brief to outsource to a company called Noiseworks, who are a sound design company that we have a really long standing relationship with. So our briefs usually use our temp track as a guide and we can elaborate in a lot more detail here exactly what we're hoping to hear. So if there's any, maybe any instruments that you want to hear or maybe even vocals, this is the place to write it all down. Now, as soon as that brief is sent over to Noiseworks, it's time for our polish pass and that's going to address anything left outstanding. It's also a chance for a cinematic artist to have a subtle colour grading pass um, and they can do this using magic bullet looks. Again, we have to tread that fine line between having our trailers look cinematic and misrepresenting the game. So while adding a subtle vignette and making adjustments to the contrast levels are absolutely fine, adding filters or playing with color levels that drastically change the appearance of the game, they're just not permitted. As with everything, there's gonna be some back and forth with noise works as we refine the music and the sound effects. And again, when our lead cinematic artist is happy, they can cut this into the edit and present it to the heads of marketing. If approved, wonderful, our trailer is complete. And if not, we'll just go back and we'll make any of the adjustments requested. And then hopefully our trailer is complete. So we've been in the chat answering your questions during the presentation, but we just wanted to focus on a few great ones um, and answer them here for you guys as well. So what do we have? Okay, Ray, this one is for you. Why do you guys not use any facial capture? That is a good question. Um, well, generally we don't, we haven't been using facial capture because we didn't really need the fidelity. Our face rigs were relatively close to the game rigs and while we could have used it, the fidelity was not there to really show off the nuances of the face and so on. Um, and we didn't invest in that part of the pipeline at that point. Though, this is something we're looking forward to in the future. And um, as you can see in the Troy demo as well, we've kind of shown that we've kept, you know, we're pushing the faces and as much as possible and so on. So this is something we could potentially do in the future. Yeah, I hope that answers that. Uh, let's see, let me pick another question. This one for you, Anna. How long did it take you to learn the proprietary software? Uh, okay. Um, not too long. So like I mentioned in the presentation earlier, we do use our own in-house software but it has been influenced from a variety of um, other more mainstream pieces of, of software. So I came from a film background, but once I joined the team, the skills that I already had were quite easy to adapt into the software that we use here at CA. Um, and also when you first join the company, you're not just thrown into this new software that you have no idea how to use. Um, you're paired up with a buddy, and your buddy is going to go through everything with you um, and just yeah just run through everything so you're really comfortable and we also have a lot of online resources as well we have like a really good like wiki page and any questions that you any questions that you have or anything you're unsure about you can just talk to your buddy or anyone on the team really um, they're always like really happy to help so uh, in summary not very long at all really um, Give, give yourself like, I don't know, 
just a week really to learn the basics and then you can just kind of push straight through really it's fine uh, what else have we got okay uh, right when you talk about the rigs that you use for cinematics are all the things like cloth and hair hand animated um, wouldn't they be physics based in any way that is a good question um, so generally we once we build our rigs we do have you know the controls and so on that we need for the cloth for the hair etc and what we usually do in our pipeline is on the animation side we kind of pre we use our tools to generate the uh, simulations on top of that and then bake it down back to the controls so what you get is basically you're pre-baking the simulations of whatever the animation is doing and how this works is we, we have a bunch of tools to you know you select your controls uh, you can apply a simulation on it and basically the simulation rig will start driving the actual rig and once you're happy you can tweak it based off whatever the character is doing based off whatever actions you need you can tweak it and once you're happy you can bake it down and this could work for anything including let's say you have uh, wind for example we can put the wind simulations um, onto the simulation rig that's driving everything else um, and this is all done in Maya. In game, we don't, uh, at the moment, we don't have any simulation based uh, or real time simulations. Though we could do a lot of this via shaders as well, um, simulating how wind works and so on. So it depends on the use. But in general, we do it on the rigs. Yeah. That's just a long winded answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's see, pick one out here. This might be for you, Anna, as you put shots together. Um, is there a system you guys have to pull animations apart a bit, apart a bit, so that uh, all you're doing, uh, so that all of the characters are not doing the same animation at the same time? Are there options for you to play with that kind of stuff? Uh, in short, yes. Um... So I mentioned earlier in the presentation that our main uh, in-house software is called CompScene. So in CompScene, um, we can we can load in a you know a large amount of different characters, um, and we can put on, for example, the same animation. So it'll set a walk cycle. So they're all walking. All the characters will be walking at exactly the same time, which is not very realistic and not very convincing in a trailer. Um, but within CompScene, what we can do is we can offset all of the animations uh, by however long we want to. Um, so now all our characters will be walking at different times. Um, we also have a character generator button. So we can select all of our soldiers, for example, hit this button, and they'll all have different faces or um, yeah, different faces and different hair. Um, just so that they look different, just so they look varied, and then with the offset animation, you can they, you have like a like a marching group of soldiers that now suddenly looks so much more convincing um, than you did five minutes ago when everyone was walking at exactly the same time and doing exactly the same thing. Um, we obviously have different types of animation, so in this case, if it was a walk cycle, we could not only just offset the animation, we can select different characters, put different walk cycles on them, so that they are quite clearly not doing the same thing as the people next to them um, and just all these really small fine details just really help to bring the trailer alive really so I hope that answers that um, my turn to have a look um, okay right when rigging for cinematics what is your approach to the use of IK versus FK is this different from the rigs that you used for the characters in the game? Let's see. So, in general, when we do the cinematic rigs, we work off the base rigs, like uh, you've seen in the presentation. Um, so what we do is we grab the base rigs and we start being additive on top of it. So uh, all our animation, you know, the cinematic animation requirements will be additive on top of the base rig. So if you, the question about if the rigs are different, the bases aren't that different, but the additions are different. So 
for example, there won't be the extra clothing rigs and so on, which the game doesn't need since you know, there's so many units on screen, you don't necessarily need uh, joints or controls for each and everything. So that way, yes, the characters do differ from the cinematic rig, but the base rigs are similar. As for the question about IK versus FK, um, this, it really depends on the type of animation because FK lends itself well to things that need arcs uh, and so on. Though there are some animators who prefer to animate purely in IK and then they build in their arcs from there. Though each style of animation and the actions that are happening generally lend itself to one or the other. And there's nothing stopping anyone from mixing and matching in a scene as well. So we do have tools to match the animations to FK and match the animations to IK or I switch between one or the other. So this is really dependent on what's happening in the scene and the workflow of the animator as well. I hope, uh, I hope that answers that one. Let's see. Um, here's one. Uh, Anna, do you have to use Maya for your 3D work and animation? Should that be the focus of what I learn or can I use something else like Blender, for example? Okay, now that is a good question. So our animators do use Maya. Um, so if you're focusing um, on a career in animation, then yes, it would be great to learn Maya. Um, and that's gonna really, really obviously help you because you'll know exactly what you're doing as soon as you start your, your new role. Um, if you are looking um, for another, to work in another area of game cinematics, um, so like just to be a cinematic artist, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, we use in-house software. So anything that you're gonna be learning at university is gonna be helpful. Um, you're gonna find when you join the team that there's gonna be a lot of similarities between anything that you've been learning to what we've been using, because we have been influenced by other more mainstream types of software. Um, so anything you're learning isn't a waste of time. It's all really, really valid. Um, and you will be able to use something similar when you join CA, just not exactly the same. If you are more focused in animation, then yes, Maya would be the uh, route for you. Very cool. Yeah, I think something else I'd like to add to that in addition is um, it's very important, especially when you're starting your career, to understand that depending on what discipline you're in, make sure that you learn the foundations and try not to concentrate too much on the software aspect of things. Like, you know, for example, if it's animation, you know, learn a uh, really brush up on the 12 principles, make sure your posing is strong, et cetera, et cetera, because those are the core skills that will be transferable to any software that can't be, it's not, it's software agnostic and it's the same for any other kind of field, let's say for rigging, have a good understanding of anatomy, um, deformations, and even the technical aspect of things. Uh, so it's very important to do, learn the core aspect of your, of what you're doing and try to keep that as your main goal. And software will come in play uh, in time because that's, it's like when you learn how to structure a language, you just need to learn how it works in different languages and go on from there and you can switch. So, yeah. That's really good, I think. Okay. I have another question for you, Ray. Why do you up your characters? Are they not built in ZBrush anyway? Or do you model a low poly model from the start and up it? That's a good question. So a lot of the game assets are done before we generally start our cinematics. For the most part, there are certain situations it's not. But what happens is the artists do work off uh, zebra sculpts. So they will create a zebra sculpt um, and then they'll build the mesh from it. They'll retopple it and so on. But what we tend to do is uh, again, it's all about not misrepresenting the game. So what we do is we generally take what's there from the game and we, we will use a sculpt to extract more details. 
uh, where possible. There are certain situations the sculpt might not have as much details as we need, so in those cases we will touch it up. Though for the question of why don't we just build it from the zebra sculpt, I would say that it's actually quicker for us to work off the game model that's already there and up res it. It's much quicker to do that than to re-topologize the sculpt and rebake the textures and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, let me look at another question now. Alrighty, let's see. Um, here's one for Yana. There's a piece where all the crowds are going uphill and there are a lot of characters moving at once. How are you moving so many characters at once? Are you using a particle system? Uh, what's the technology behind moving all these objects? Okay, okay, so I, I know which, uh, which shot uh, they're referencing. Um, okay, so the shot in question has just so many, many characters. Um, so basically, um, for, for something like this, when we're gonna show so many characters at the, at the same time, Sometimes it's easier for us to just use the game logic. So we go in the game, we place our troops and, and we can record them moving. And we can record, we can play this back um, as many times as we like and also add our own characters into the foreground from comp scene. So in comp scene, we would um, create our like hero characters who are gonna be the focus of the shot closest to the, closest to the camera make sure they're looking good, make sure their timing's correct, make sure that they're um, just looking as, as good as possible. Then we can place them in engine into our game in Cindy. And then in the background, we have all of our um, troops that we've laid out in engine. Then together, they'll now work seamlessly. But although we don't really have too much control, I mean, we can, um, on the in-game characters, we can, you know, show which direction we want them to move. All of the foreground characters, all of the main focus on the shot are going to be very, very controlled. And we're going to know exactly how it's going to look. And we can look through the camera as well just to make sure everything's uh, working fine. Um, yes, and that's how, that's how we do it really. Um, we could make the whole thing in comp scene, but it doesn't really seem that beneficial. It wasn't in this case anyway. It was just a lot easier for us to grab our treats, put them in place, and then add our key hero characters uh, to the front of shot and just focus all our attention on those. So that's how we made that shot. Okay, what have we got next? Um, okay, so you use motion capture for your cinematics. Is this used for the in-game animations too? How do you go about adding more keyframe animation on top of the motion capture data? Um, short answer is yes, we do use motion capture for the in-game animations. Um, and it really depends on the type of animation. Um, obviously, we can't, uh, certain things we can't capture, so those are hand keys. But for those that we can capture, um, yeah, it is captured. And as you saw in the presentation, we have a retargeting pipeline where everything gets retargeted back to the rigs. So once it gets retargeted back to the rigs, the animation's just on the controllers. And there are a few steps, um, depending on what it's doing, depending on what needs to be done. Um, we either use animation layers to add more animation on top of it. So we'll use animation layers, start you know, offsetting from the original base animation or um, sometimes we can also uh, clean up the keyframes and then tweak it from there if need be. Though in this case, it's a bit destructive because you're kind of breaking the base layer. But yeah, that's pretty much it. We just use animation layers and start adding uh, animations on top of that or reusing parts and cleaning up the keys from there, really. Yeah, I think, I hope that answers that question. Um, Let's see, look through here. This one for you, Anna. What sort of choices do you make when lighting a shot? Okay. Okay, well, that's a good question because I really uh, enjoy lighting. Um, so as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we do the main bulk of our lighting in-engine in Cindy. 
So what we'll do is we've got our scene set up in comp scene, then we'll take it into Cindy and we'll open the environment editor, which allows us to tweak um, custom made, um, allows us to tweak, sorry, um, environments that are already available to us in the game. So I guess one of the first things I think about is like the mood. So I'll choose like um, a type of weather that's going to reflect the mood that we're looking for. Um, and then I need to think about where the, where the key light is coming from and how the shadows are going to look. And now this key light is usually going to come from the sun or the moon. Um, so I'll position that to make sure that everything's looking cinematic, everything's looking logical and everything's looking good, basically. Then I will take that into comp scene. And it's in comp scene that I start to add my uh, more bespoke lighting really, just to just to elevate it really to look more cinematic. So I can add like a soft fill light and I'll add like rim lights just to make the characters pop, but keeping it quite subtle because like we've said a few times now, we have to be really careful not to misrepresent the game. Um, so we do work on a shot by shot basis, but we can share, um, you know, like items and, and other things like that. So if there's a sequence of shots running back to back, I can use the exactly the same lighting setup and environment setup I've used from my first shot and I can tweak them ever so slightly just to make sure each one is looking as good as it possibly can. Um, and that's about it really. Okay, I'm just checking on the time quickly. One of the questions we have is how did we, you get into cinematics? How did you first start uh, in the industry? Uh, I guess I'll go first then. <laughs> um, so I've always been interested in video games. Um, it's been a huge part of my life since I was very young. And initially, well, obviously I played a lot of games when I was younger, but what I started doing at a certain age was I started modding games. Um, and that's basically how it started. I used to mod games and then I started getting more and more interested into the art stream of things at at that point i wanted to be uh, an artist first and i was not very artistic at all but uh, you know i continued trying to practice and so on and this was all in my own time back then and uh, then i started as i learned more and more about the industry i started getting more interested in different areas so i started getting interested in being a modeler at that point and for quite a while, I wanted to be a modeler. And in general, this is what most people get interested in when they first join the industry, because it's one of the first things they get uh, introduced to. And um, from modeling, the natural progression is you want to start seeing your models move. And that's where I started getting interested in animation and rigging. And pretty much that's where my, uh, that's where I focused into. and. I was working in television for most of my career um, and a rigger. And um, yeah, and again, I've always had a love for the video games, so it just felt right to move into cinematics as well, since I get the best of both worlds where I've, I get the cinematic side of things and I also get the game side of things. And yeah, that's more or less my journey in a very brief blurb. How about you, Anna? Um, okay, I'll try not to drag this on for too long. I, I guess mine's quite similar to you in a way. Um, I grew up really into film and really into games. I just really, really enjoyed them, but I never really thought how I could get, you know, how I could turn this into a career. It wasn't really something I was focusing on at the time. Um, and then when I was finishing uh, secondary school, I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I still loved games, I still loved film, but the careers advice at the time wasn't wasn't very good. Um, it was basically it was more focused on um, standard careers, and I and I just I just was really confused. I knew that I wasn't I knew that I really wanted to get into this sort of area, but I didn't know how. Um, so what I ended up doing was a art foundation uh, course for a year. Uh, which was amazing, which it was, it was brilliant. Um, I got to try all different types of um, 
medium and just experiment and be super artistic and get to see what sort of things I actually enjoyed. And I, I found that I really enjoyed animation. So after leaving the uh, course, I took part in an animation degree and I, I loved it really. Um, but my main focus in the degree was storytelling. I just really enjoyed, I just really enjoyed the storytelling aspect of it. And I got to direct my own end of year film um, for my degree and that was fantastic. So I knew now finally the sort of direction I wanted to be going in. Um, and then I got a job in film and I stayed in the film industry for quite a long time and I did quite a few different roles within that. I think one of my favourite roles was working as a previous artist because you really got to get involved in the story then. You are setting down all the cameras, um, all the placement, it's just so, it, I just really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then after that I took some time out to go travelling and whilst on my travels um, I got headhunted by Creative Assembly um, and I heard more about the role and I was just, it was just thought it was an amazing opportunity uh, because now I had already worked in film but now I get to work in the other area that I'm super interested in which is games but still focusing on the story um, so that was really important to me and um, yep the rest is history. That is very cool. <laughs> um, I think we've run out of time actually Ray. Yeah um, well I guess uh, yeah I guess that's about it for now. Uh, time kind of passed very quickly. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching this BAFTA Games live stream uh, from Creative Assembly and watch the space for future tutorials. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.